today we have the very special guest uh, who is the owner of manufacturing company the laureate of brand me ceo forbes in 2020 psychologist mentor businesswoman and powerful leader małgorzata wieniaszewska first of all thank you very much for the invitation and such an introduction uh, today I'd like to talk about leaders of today and tomorrow and uh, I know you're going to learn about it for the next months. However, I'd like to share my experience, uh, especially that I'm also after, let me just work on it for a moment, sorry, yeah, it works. So Embe Pneumatica, where I am the founder and the owner of the company, is the only company in Poland that is manufacturing fittings to uh, braking and air suspension systems. This is automotive business, so one of the three largest in Europe and the only one in Poland. And the products that we manufacture are in most commercial vehicles in the world. This is what I'm proud of, but let me continue. My company uh, received the economic award of the president of Poland in the family company category in 2018 edition of the competition. Also a nomination for the prestigious trailer innovation 2019. That was the award of the EAA commercial vehicle in Hanover in components category. We were the only one Polish company in this uh, competence, so I was very proud of it. Uh, I personally received the distinction in the 10th edition of the Businesswoman of the Year competition by the success written in Lipstick Foundation and the Family Business Accelerator Award during the Forbes Family Business Forum in 2019. Uh, probably when you hear that, you would say either wow or what a lady who is really concentrated on herself. And why I told you this is, first of all, because I'm proud of it. But as a comparison with all those awards that I received, I have to admit, I used to be a tyrant. Uh, I was not a leader. I used to be a tyrant, soulless, disrespectful to people, focused on myself and my own success. This is nothing to be proud of. But when you're entering uh, and making such a decision to actually join MBA at PG, uh, there was this on the agenda you could see, I uh, even written down this sentence, MBA is not only the education, but values we bring together. And today I'd like to talk about values because education will be given to you at PG and I'm sure you're gonna get it very well. But about values, first of all, you have to work on them yourself. And as a leadership, uh, as a leader, I used to have a leadership based on capitalism. Probably most of you know it. If you don't, let me just remind you. Profits, shareholder value, individual meaning my success, not my team, not the people, my. Why it was so important, I was grown in such a, culture, I would say. I was 21 years old when I took over the business from my father, a production company, and I really had no idea how to manage it. Being a leader meant paying uh, to the workers, I would call them workforce, which was horrible, and uh, paying, and that was the only thing uh, I could be proud of because the rest was really horrible. I had no respect to people and I was really bad at managing, screaming, basically shouting, kicking out from the company. That was the way I uh, acted. Again, I want you to understand uh, why I'm telling this. It's not the question of having a half an hour speech about how bad I was, but about somehow a transition between uh, who I was and who I am now and what you can do as long as you know what value, values, uh, values you have. So from this leadership based on capitalism, I would say that this is the road to nowhere and the short-term path 
and a short-sighted perspective, however you call it, it's basically negative. And of course, there would be some leaders who would tell, what are you lady talking about? Profits are the most important. Who cares about people if there are no profits? But guys, wake up, we're living in a different world. Paul Karofsky uh, was the one who showed such a definition that I really like. It's from the book, um, from Maxwell book, uh, that was actually published this year. And it says, by definition, leaders have followers. Followers need a direction. Giving direction requires making a decision. Making a decision requires considering the possibilities. And considering the possibilities requires dealing with uncertainty. This is what uh, Barbara was saying. This is probably everyone who is actually experiencing uncertainty as a leader. Uh, and I would say that's obvious. And what John Maxwell says also is, if you want to be a successful, uh, be successful as a leader, you must learn to feel comfortable with insecurity and constant change. And I would add, in addition, human being is a subject, not an object. And if you are aware of it, uh, you would probably one of the best leaders in the world. And you can do it, believe me. What I'd like you to show today and discuss just for a few minutes is the human-centered leadership of tomorrow. And this is something that Stanford University Center for Compassion and Altruism Research, together with Cecil Peer Consulting, have done. They've done the meta-analysis of existing research. And what they've done is they confirmed that enduring businesses that make it through unprecedented volatility, ambiguity and change, go way beyond a singular purpose. Uh, pay attention to this because it's not a singular purpose. It's not your purpose, it's the whole team. Invest in building culture, something that I would never think about when I used to live and used to be a leader from the capitalism. Reach for a differentiated employee experience. This is also really important. And activate energy in leaders to leverage beyond their capital resources. If you still don't believe that the human-centered leadership is the leadership actually of today and tomorrow, let's go deeper in it. Here are the factors that enable companies to engage a sustainable growth. Of course, according to the meta analysis done by Stanford University, there are two adaptability and resilience. So, if you're thinking about sustainable growth of your company or you as a leader, you have to think about adaptability and resilience. And the drivers for adaptability and resilience. I would say they're really straightforward. It's just the question if you think about them, understand them, and use them. First of all, they said that leaders have to sit in many chairs. So it's no longer the power of status. As you probably remember, also Maxwell was saying that there are five levels of leadership. And the first one is just the status. So you become a director. The name is really nice, but you have no competences. And if you go this way, it doesn't work. It doesn't work like a human-centered leadership. And this is what we're aiming at today. Uh, in my opinion, this is the only way to manage people. And I would say manage is the wrong word because you don't actually manage people today. You become a leader and the, those people, if they follow you, that's the thing that you're actually aiming at. So first of all, they say leaders sit in many chairs because this awakens potential everywhere. If you have a lot of experience as a leader at different places and different positions, then you probably know what you're doing. As a second point, leaders lead themselves. Uh, this is very important because self-leadership before leading others is really important. I'm a great example of this. In the past, 
I was the one who was trying to lead others without self uh, leading my without leading myself. It resulted in not understanding anything of leadership. As I said, not being respectful and not actually even looking at the team that I was trying to manage. I didn't care about them. I cared about profits. So now when you look at the leaders that lead themselves, I would say when I understood this second point, I finally, it was about 10 years ago when I actually graduated from the psychologist university. Then I understood that this is the main point of being a human-centered leader. Then number three, leaders lead to win minds, hands, and hearts. This is the holistic experience beyond rational and data. If you understand that leaders do not only win uh, your mind, but also hands and hearts, meaning that you would en engage actually those people, your team, would be engaged by you being as an example. Not only having, like in the point number four, execution excellence, because this is something that is really important. And I'm sure that if you don't know how to do it now, you will learn it at PG. But leaders also lead for execution and connection. Competitive advantage comes from empathy and creativity in addition to execution and excellence. And I know that the word empathy is actually the one that you've probably heard many times. We are talking about empathetic people. We're talking about empathetic leaders, especially in COVID times. And we're saying that if the leader is empathetic, that means that they understand what uh, their team is actually expecting, what problems they are facing. And this is really important also in COVID times due to the fact that you have your teams isolated, probably home office workers. You don't gather together anymore uh, in the reality, let's call it. And the question to a leader is, how are you going to lead your people if they are isolated, if you don't understand them as a human being, but as a worker only? Worker or employee is a good word. But behind this word, I would say there is a human being and each human being is experiencing and some different uh, values. And you as a leader should gather those people together in their mindset, hands and hearts, and then they would actually follow you. And the last one, why I put it right, leaders are purposeful of growth, remain committed to learning. Just an example, uh, again of myself, I, first of all, I wanted to be the teacher of English. So when I was 21 years old, I was studying the English biology and I thought this is the only way I can actually uh, step into a professional life. Then I learned that uh, I didn't want to be uh, the owner of the company. It was actually my father who came to me when I was 21 and he told me I'm uh, very badly ill and somebody has to take over the business. So I was not prepared at all and I, I took it actually from him, <laughs> took it over. I was not really proud of it. I was unhappy. Uh, then uh, step by step, I was actually learning how to do it to become a leader. And it took me more than 10 years, unfortunately that long. But I would be also a good example of those leaders who have no idea how to lead. They don't even know how to manage people. And then they become leaders that, to be honest, that are really proud of themselves, but also uh, as a confirmation, your teams, meaning my team, are really proud of me. And so that means then I decided to actually go to psychology studies due to the fact that I thought, that the only way to teach me how to manipulate my people, my team, would be to go to psychology studies, which was a horrible experience. But thank God, after two years, I realized that the only person that I should work on and change the behavior, the mindset, etc., is me. And finally, I realized 
that the only person that I should work on is myself. So remain committed to learning is the fifth point of the Stanford University meta-analysis that says, do it if you want to be a human-centered leadership leader. And here are the mindset that support those leadership behaviors, also according to this meta-analysis. And I think for most of us, they should be obvious. Unfortunately, now, unfortunately, somehow they're not. A leader has to have a mindset that uh, actually support those behaviors, caring over control, human-centered leadership, guys. If you care about your team, you don't have to control it somehow because they know exactly what they have to do, but you show something that they expect from you. And then they also become, a, let's call it a human being. Abundance over scarcity, well-being or benefit over welfare. This is something that I actually, uh, I would say, fought for a long time. And I thought that it's basically impossible. If you have your own family business that's been existing on the market for 36 years, how can you forget about the welfare, about the profit and concentrate on well-being and or benefit? This is, you know, uh, for the owner, it sounds really crazy, really crazy. But then I realized that if you pay attention to well-being or to benefit, and if you pay attention to well-being of your people, especially the team that you work with, then the welfare is behind, but the profits is obvious. So that means we pay a lot of attention, uh, especially currently at, uh, at the moment, we pay attention to well-being of our people, meaning they have uh, special programs uh, because as I said, we are isolated. We don't want them to be burnt out. So uh, there is a psychological support if they need it. And this is just the beginning. I'm talking about the COVID times, but it was also something before. So well-being was important. The very famous word work-life balance was another word that everyone hates. But uh, in my opinion, this is something that is really important if you want your, uh, your team to actually accomplish the goals. They don't have to be tired anymore, basically. Productive over defensive. I used to be really defensive. And I, will, I used to actually, let's call it, kill my people. You know, I lost a lot of very good members of the team due to my uh, behavior and due to the mindset that I had. And due to the fact that I did not understand that the most important is the human being in my company. It's not the money. Because if you care for the human being, the money comes. And interconnectedness over self-orientation. I started with self-orientation, this presentation. I showed you how proud I should be with all those awards that I actually received. But to be honest, I'll show you later on what I'm really proud of. Collective over individual, ongoing learning over fixed, and practice over action. Remember about the fact that you have to allow your people to make mistakes. And I know it sounds really obvious. It's not. In many cases, if it doesn't come to your mind that the, the team is allowed to make mistakes, and this is the only way they learn, this is something that will be very important for the future and for actually for now as well. And this is what I'm proud of. And this is the only award that I'm proud of. And I know it sounds really bad because I should also be proud of all those ones that were before. But why? Because in 2020, I was awarded in the prestigious uh, Forbes competition, Brand Me CEO, as the most authentic leader. Why I'm proud of it? Because this was the award that I received just a few months ago. And when I... Uh, came back to my company and I uh, walked in. There was a team standing and waiting for me, the whole team of my company. There's like 100 people working there. 
I didn't know about this surprise, but they were standing there and uh, just to uh, congratulate me. And you know what's, what, what was really um, touching was the fact that they did not have to do it. No, I didn't pay much money for congratulating me. They actually came themselves to say, hi, we're proud of you. So I actually had a long road. I experienced a very long road from a very tiring person to a leader. A leader who respects people, is empathetic, trustworthy, and gives value to the team. And what I wish you to do during the next two, okay, during the next uh, months, I would say uh, pay attention to the people. Of course, pay attention to what you're taught because this is the only way you ask. There was one of those points stating that you have to actually study over and over again, get new knowledge, but pay attention to the values and pay attention to the fact that hopefully you're going to learn how to be a human-centered leader because this is the only way you can survive according to my opinion and not only my also to Stanford which I think is much more important than mine but this is what you learn this is the most important thing be a human being for the human beings that you have in your company thank you very much <laughs>